Welcome back to Matters of Faith. We're in Wimbledon, London, with Sheikh Hassan uh, Geiten. Many people call him Sheikh Hassan because Geiten um, has actually also worked in the London Central Mosque for over 20 years, editing uh, a quarterly called mm -hmm. the Islamic Quarterly. That's right. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, what was your experience with the British Muslim community? And how did it go together with Sufism? It's not known to be a Sufi mosque, the London Central Mosque. It was, I think, extremely interesting because it was very easy for Europeans who adopt a Sufi path to distance themselves from the Ummah, that is, from the community of Islam. Now, that, I think, is wrong. We may find the majority of our fellow Muslims <laughs> misbehave a lot and can be very tiresome. Nonetheless, we are part of the same body, and that is something fundamentally. And therefore, I think it was very useful for me to have this close contact with um, ordinary practicing Muslims. Because obviously working in a mosque, um, these were on the whole people who practiced their religion. And a huge variety, obviously. I had my office there, I worked three days a week, I just carried on. And um, I came to the conclusion, the common English saying that people may prefer the devil they know to any stranger, that that is rather an Arab habit. They knew me, they knew me then very well. Um, it was useful for them to have an Englishman on the staff, after as a kind of go-between between, between um, them and the host community. And, um, well, they knew me, so, you know. And any inquiries about Sufism, they would refer to you? That's right, yes, yes. They were glad of a chance to <laughs> shift that onto my shoulders <laughs> and so on. Yeah, if we look back into time, um, you, you were beautifully describing in your book uh, Islam and the Destiny of Man, how Islam spread like a wildfire. Um, you know, within a hundred years it reached from one empire to the next, from China yes, to yes. Africa and so on. Um, what was it? I mean, if we look at, you know, the state of affairs nowadays, surely it couldn't have spread if it was like that. So what was it at the time that, you know, made it spread so much? Well, of course, um, the prophet is reported to have said that his generation was the best. And then the next, and then the next, and next, and next, and next. And obviously going downhill. <laughs> yeah. we, we've gone downhill. <laughs> but, um, <coughs> It was largely by example. Now, it's a myth that Islam was spread by, con by conquest, by the sword. It wasn't, except in one sense, that of course the new Muslims, the new age, were so full of faith, so exuberant, so rushing out, wanting to conquer and so on, they did conquer many territories. Now, they, they, they never forced anybody to embrace their religion. On the contrary, many of them felt, you know, it's our religion, we don't want to share it. But nonetheless, um, obviously, people who wanted the best jobs and so on and so forth saw an interest in becoming Muslim. So, from that minor point of view, um, conquest aided the spread. But in the main, and this can be attributed to Sufi traders, particularly in South India, in Malaysia, in Indonesia, these men were simple traders in many cases, or in most cases, in fact, Sufis, going, going about their business peacefully. And the local people, the indigenous people, who on the whole lived in some disorder, saw these good men and thought, well, these are the first really good people we've met. Hmm. Why is that? Because they're Muslim. 
And so you had these massive conversions, and that does apply particularly to, as I say, Malaysia and Indonesia. And um, it's only much later that you had extremist forms of Islam. How did Sufism um, attract people? You said you were, you know, almost converted through Su Sufism. You know, your faith was strengthened. Um, oh, yes. All these people you just mentioned were inspired by Sufi traders. What is it about um, Sufism that inspires people? Um, two things, I suppose. One, obviously, is that this is a very effective means of approaching God, of becoming as aware of Him as we are capable of doing. Secondly, Sufism has always been a path of peace, charity, mercy, concern for others. And these are immensely attractive qualities, and alas, rather rare qualities in the world today. Just uh, for clarity, um, Sufism is solely related to Islam, or yes. where did it originate? No, it originates <coughs> in Islam. Um, people confuse their terms. And this is something that always annoys me a bit because it's, as Orwell taught us, it's very important to get the right words applied to the right realities. Of course, mysticism, of one sort or another, one shape or another, has existed for as long as one knows. I mean, you know, way, 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 way back. But it takes a different colouring, different emphasis, according to the cultural and the religious context in which it is found. And it therefore had inevitably to arise within Islam, and it did so with an Islamic colouring. To understand this better, can you define the nature of God in Islam? Um, well, you see, this is always difficult because um, we know that he cannot be defined. That is the basic principle. Having said this, we have to have some idea in our heads of what we mean by God. And according to a very important hadith, a very important hadith could see, an inspired saying of the Prophet. God has said, uh, roughly, I hope I'm getting the words right, I am in the image that my servant has of me. And this can only be an aspect of the divine mercy. So, we ha in order to worship, you've got to have some idea of who or what you're worshipping. You can't worship the totally un unknown. And at the same time, in the Quran, you have these 99 beautiful names of God, revealed names. And these obviously can be explored almost indefinitely to show the divine qualities. But because they cover the whole spectrum, they also inevitably cover contradictions. And in Sufism, uh, those divine names are sometimes um, almost stepping stones to, to God, or uh, are they're used somehow um, they are. to acquire, imbibe the qualities of God. Yes, oh yes. Um, so how can Sufism lead to God, in a sense? Um, remember that uh, Sufism is divided into various turuk or tariqas, as they're mm -hmm. called. And um, each derives its strength from some great sheikh, some great teacher. And in each case, there are slightly, slightly different techniques. It doesn't really matter much. Um, 
Some, for example, will invoke La ilaha illallah, the declaration of the divine unity. Others will simply invoke the name of God, Allah. Others will call upon particular divine names, Ya Latif, Ya Rahman, Ya Karim, and so on. Um, these are unimportant differences because there could not just be one way of doing things. There could not just be one technique, I don't like the word technique, one manner of approaching God. There have to be countless ones. And indeed, it is said often enough that there is a way for each individual and that no two individual ways are quite identical. There are as many ways or paths to God as their hearts. Uh, exactly. Almost. Exactly. But one thing they all have in common is that they, are, they bring about transformation somehow. Well, Can you explain this? it's difficult to talk about transformation because um, God alone can read hearts. This is one of the most fundamental things. It's something that always made it difficult for me personally to judge people. If I don't, I can't see into their hearts. And um, you cannot know, basically, if somebody has really been transformed or not. It may be that in an extreme crisis, you can see by the way they deal with the crisis, if they are different to the person that they were previously. But that is why in Islam, testing trials are so important. Well, thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Christian. Okay, it was wonderful seeing you. Bless thank you, you for inviting us to your okay. home and inspiring us with so many special insights. I hope you enjoyed this edition of Matters of Faith from Gay Eaton's home, and we look forward to seeing you again very soon. Bye-bye.